Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Roby Ganguly is today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast. Roby is the CEO and co-founder of Aptentive, which recently made Deloitte's Fast 500 list. Founded in 2011, Aptentive helps enterprise brands measure shifts in sentiment from customer experience to win back customers and activate fans. Aptentive helps those companies capture actionable data and proactively gather feedback from the 90% of consumer voices typically missed. In addition to growing his company, Roby is a six-time Washington State champion in Taekwondo, holy shit, badass, a frequent writer and speaker on topics related to mobile customer retention, relationship management, and lifetime value. He's also a 40 under 40 honoree and a loving husband. <laughs> Welcome, Roby. Don't laugh at that part. No, the, that's the best husband. part. And uh, I can tell that was not like from my bio on the website, which is great. <laughs> We added it just to make you extra that makes me happy. warm fuzzy. Okay, we're going to start with rapid fire. But you just had your espresso, so you should be good. Yeah. Um, okay, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? President. Oh, well, we still have time. <laughs> Our first Indian Jewish oh, president. Yeah, for sure. I we was born like in that. Madison, Wisconsin, so I can do it. Done and done. Um, okay, what is your superpower? I have a really great memory, and I remember details about friendships and relationships that are super meaningful to both of us. Nice. And um, is there a movie that you have watched more than three times? And if so, which one? There are a bunch. Um, I have watched... Like, what's your favorite movie of all time? So it's it's definitely like a John Cusack movie. It's either Say Anything or Gross Point Blank. Uh, but I love John Both Cusack. Both great movies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you could have a front row seat to any concert of any time frame of life, which one would you choose? Yeah. So I was actually front row for you two uh, years ago when they were, um, I'm forgetting the name of the tour, but they had this beautiful heart shaped stage. And I was right at the edge. And Bono was there like four feet away from me. And Larry Mullen was there like 10 feet away from me. And they started the show there, which was awesome. And so hard to imagine. Better than that for you, too. So maybe I would say Pearl Jam. There was a pretty epic concert in, like, the early 2000s um, in Boston where Eddie got apparently pretty fired up and put on just an amazing show. That would yeah. be great. That would be an amazing. I've seen both of them in concert, but not front row, obviously. Okay. Are you mountains or water? Water. And introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. Oh, nice. Okay. You made it through. Good job. <laughs> and you're faster than most. Some of them, I'm like, okay, rapid fire, rapid fire. <laughs> As I said, rapid fire. Okay, so I know you were born in Madison. You just mentioned that. Yeah. And so what brought you to Seattle? Because I know you were raised in Seattle. Yeah, so my parents met at the UW Milwaukee, and they had me in Madison a few years later. And then when I was nine months old, they moved from Madison to Portland, Oregon for a job. My dad was... Um, biomedical devices engineer and, and uh, found a job in Portland that fit his profile. So then they were there for about four years. Uh, and then they moved up here to Seattle. And so I really remember a tiny bit of Portland being mm -hmm. there, but I really you just grew better up here anyway. Here. Yeah, <laughs> better sure. here anyway. And so um, you're the oldest yep. and you've got two younger sisters. Yeah. And um, as we walked in, I got to know this detail about you. And I mentioned it in our in our opening that you are half Jewish half Indian, your dad's Indian. Yeah. And does that come with the typical, as a Jewish person, I feel like I can say like that pressure of staying within the culture as far as how you were raised and also being successful? Yeah. So I think the staying in the culture was never a part of it because my mom um, had married my dad. He's Indian and he's from India, fully Indian. And she was born in Austria and grew up in Iowa and then Wisconsin and... You know, when she met my dad, it was 
as they as they tell the story, it was very clear very early on that they were pretty serious about each other. So I don't think I how, ever how did felt, they meet? Um, my mom's advisor, I think, in college said. I know that you like Indian culture and you have a lot of interests sort of like looking east. So this is like the 60s, which I think a lot of people were starting to look east and say, where's meaning? Um, so she, she had on her own taken up cooking Indian food and sort of studying the religion, studying different faiths, not just Indian culture. But um, her advisor was on the staff. So my dad was uh, essentially a graduate student at the UW Milwaukee. He came here when he was 17 on a, a scholarship to be essentially a master's um, candidate and to teach. And so she got to see him on the staff and said, I think that you guys might hit it off. So I introduced him. And, sure enough, and was, that, was that a um, welcome love from both families? Uh, I don't think that my grandparents on my dad's side were really happy about it. Mm -hmm. um, they were far, far away in India. The, you know, in the first place, I think the fact that he had gone to the U.S. was... Probably um, more controversial than you would think. He was mm -hmm. 17. He was pretty young when he came here. Um, and then I think that as they tell the story, like my first, uh, the first several years of them being married, my my grandparents on um, his side were just not super big fans of my mom. Well, they probably also had never met anybody Jewish, being from India. Yeah, and I don't know if they have even thought about the Jewish faith so much as just that she's not Indian. Just not Indian, yeah. yeah. And I think that was it. And so is it one of those stories for you when you were little that you felt like, well, I'm not quite this, not quite that? Because especially being raised in Seattle where there's not that much diversity, yeah, especially I think, in Redmond. I think the thing was very much that I was different. Mm -hmm. Like I had a different name when it came time to go to school. So you sit in school, and I think a lot of people forget this, but the first day of every school year is the day that your name gets butchered the most. Oh, for sure. And in Redmond in 1982, 83, 84, my name was butchered a lot um, because there weren't really any Indians in Redmond. Mm -hmm. And I was the first Indian, like, in the neighborhood and probably in the school for a few years. And I remember, I want to say it was like 85, 86, another Indian moved to the same neighborhood. And we were like, wow, there's <laughs> another one. Yeah. Um, so when we hung out for culture events, we got together with Indians who were typically down in Renton working at Boeing. Like mm. a lot of the people I grew up with worked at Boeing. And that was oh, interesting. a nexus of Indian people. And did your dad end up teaching or what did your dad do? No, he ended up um, being an entrepreneur, actually. So oh, he wow. was in biomedical devices. He like moved up here, worked for a couple different um, laboratory R&D, biomedical device companies. And then he ended up starting his own when I was nine. So hmm. you're a first generation American. How has that been for you as far as um, shaping you? I think it's part of the reason I wanted to be president mm -hmm. is that um, I felt like a lot of things were broken and things weren't really like fair for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I first and foremost felt that my my way, like the the relationships I had with people definitely revolved around whether or not they liked that I was different or they didn't. And mm -hmm. having a different name and, and being pressed to do really well in school made me very different mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And did that, there's so many entrepreneurs that I talk to that talk about um, being driven by kind of the chip on your shoulder to prove that you're badass, or are you just like, oh, it's expected, so of course I am? I think it was both. The The thing I remember early on was that my my parents, my dad in particular, pushed me to do work and to mm -hmm. do work at a level that he expected, not that the school expected. Work which, like school work or like outside of school, school work? School, mental work, like the the thing that our family would joke about of uh, being true in our household and not a lot of other households that we knew is that my dad would give me math homework on the summer. Like he would actually write up problems and just say, okay, go do this. Um, and so there was that. And then there was also the aspect of you could do work in terms of reading if you wanted to not be bothered on family trips. So we would take a lot of trips in the car. And if I just brought several books along and I could just read, then you know, I was fine and I didn't have to do anything else. But if I wasn't reading, it was like, hey, look at this monument or pay attention to the things we're going. But mm. like, And so I could just bury my head in a book. But what that taught me was to find things that I thought were interesting on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. What were you into and, and 
um, I guess, fueled by as a kid. It's unique to want to be president. I have not interviewed anybody. <laughs> Actually, I did a video of little kids for fuel for like a holiday card for the clients. Yeah. And interviewed, um, you know, kids ages like five to 14 and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And one kid said president. He might actually be. Yeah? Yeah. What was I into? I was into... Clearly Taekwondo. How old were you when you started that? I started that just before. I was like 15 days before my 10th birthday. I mm. was I was small and I got picked on a bunch. And by that point, getting picked on a bunch was starting to get physical. So I, I definitely like watched The Karate Kid and kind of wanted that wax for on, myself. Wax on, wax off. And my, my mom got sort of a little bit tired of me talking about it, complaining about it, and like, you know, uh, running down the, the hall and kicking things. And then um, she was taking my... Uh, younger sister to try out at ballet and there was this taekwondo studio like four four doors down from the ballet studio mm -hmm. and the school was maybe a month and a half old and the master master huang was outside just waving people in and i was his fourth student like we walked like ever. in and they put the uniform on me and i wouldn't take it off what is taekwondo because i get that all the martial arts a little confused like i can picture it yeah but i i feel like there's so many martial arts like how'd you choose that one and well so the first thing to know about taekwondo is it's korean so if mm -hmm. you're talking to people like a lot of martial arts come from regions so it's korean and it's very focused on legs like your advantage is using your legs to kick people because they're longer and they're stronger than using your hands Whereas some martial arts like judo are about throws and using your arms and your momentum. Or karate has a lot more hand movement and like chopping and um, punching and defending. Taekwondo is very leg driven. And mm -hmm. so. And what are the rules? Like, how do you win? Um, well, technically, as a real martial art, there's no real winning. Like, the philosophy is about defense of self and country and land, right? It's not really about going and aggressing and taking over things. And that was that was a big part of it that allowed my parents to feel comfortable with it. it was It was not about me going and beating up people. It was about mm -hmm. me developing confidence and defending myself. Um, so winning looks like being able to avoid a fight, actually. And so did you use it when you said you were kind of getting harassed at school? Did you use your Taekwondo to defend yourself? Twice. Really? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Awesome. It, you know what? It sounds like it's awesome. The first time I ever punched somebody and hurt them not at Taekwondo in class in the context of it being okay, uh, I felt like I was being picked on. And I punched this guy, and he was kind of... A friend of mine and he crumpled and he started crying and I felt horrible. So it wasn't awesome. You yeah, know? no, not awesome. Um, Why was he harassing if he was your friend? Boys are dumb when they're, I, I don't know, maybe all the time, yeah. but like when we were in third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, like we were just, I just, just like looking back did. think that people are really dumb. Yeah. And so that was, you know, the first time. And the second time I did it was a guy who had been bullying me for a long time and never let up, and I finally put an end to it, and he never bothered me again. That was more of like the stereotypical. Very satisfying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And are you still in touch with these guys? No. Uh -uh. Like, wouldn't you kind of like to go back to your reunion and be like, how you like me now? I, I've been to my reunion. <laughs> do you think that the people in high school would have expected, like, Roby's definitely going to go on to do big things? That's a funny thing about going to reunions. I went back to my 10-year reunion when I lived in the Bay Area. So, like... I grew up around here, but went to college in Southern California, and then you I went, went to, to the, Pomona. Went to Pomona College, yeah, and then I went to the Bay Area and worked there for a long time. So my tenure happened, and I was in the Bay Area, and I I flew back for it, and I, I think I was probably one of a dozen people or so who actually like flew back to come to the reunion. I just wanted to see, of course, you know, some of the people. There were four people on my list, and I got to see three of them, but. Um, yeah, so I came back, and a couple of the people that I ran into that I'd grown up with, and we'd known each other because, you know, Redmond used to be a lot smaller, so some of us had gone to elementary, junior high, and high school together, and a few of them said some things about, like, I always thought you were going to be this way and do this thing, and it was true. It was very much true about my personality. I thought that was shocking. Well, because it would have been nice to know that back then. Yeah. Yeah, For sure. I always like these parts of these types of questions, whether we're on a podcast or just having coffee, because... Now I'm a mom of three kids, and, and they're all doing great and thriving, but there's friendships and drama and kids and stuff. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's so fascinating because there's a whole little person in there with yeah. all sorts of thoughts, and they don't necessarily share the good ones. No. They just They just make fun of each other. Oh, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So how did you choose Pomona from um, Seattle? It was sort of like 25% 
skill and 75% luck. Um, so I, I applied to the classic like Ivy uh, Ivy like top notch schools, so the, the Harvard, Yale, uh, Princeton, Brown kind of thing. Like everybody else who had studied a lot and done well on SAT and gotten a good GPA, like we we're all kind of funneling towards the same thing. But then um, I also applied to a few small liberal arts colleges, and I wasn't really that aware of the differences, but. Um, came to know of Pomona because of a family friend. And that family friend, um, their son went a couple years before me and was saying it was great and really like academically prestigious and also small classes. And there was just a lot to be attracted to. So I applied to Pomona and a couple other small liberal arts colleges. Um, and then I got the letters back from people and Pomona's letter came with a handwritten note from the Dean of Admissions and it was a handwritten note about things I had accomplished and congratulating me on that. So it wasn't a like wow. Yeah. It was very specifically Rick Roby we want you. Yeah and it it made me feel differently. Of course. And so like the you know. This is a recruiting strategy to bring to Aptentive by the way. Well we we do things like this. That's great. Um, We have heart shaped boxes we like to deliver to candidates with, with notes and stuff. Um, so yeah, so that drew me over to being like much more interested. And I think part of the thing that's, that was annoying for me, that was really frustrating in junior high and high school was, um, people were not like, they weren't there for school. They were there to be in social situations and cliques developed and you're in, you're out was much more common than, hey, we're all here to learn and try and be better and grow. And for me, school was a job and I thought I was pretty good at it. Uh, And so I felt like I was at the wrong place most of the time. And then this idea that Pomona was this place that was the size of my high school but full of people like me started to really consume me. And so I chose it because of that. Was that the right decision for you? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. For sure. And was that a big um, four-year period of growth for you? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that that's when I started to realize that I could make myself not just um, be whoever I was, that I could actually decide who I wanted to be and then go there. Yeah, that's great. And so um, I know that at Pomona you studied philosophy and economics. Um, I wanted to be a philosophy major. I loved my philosophy classes. Um, what were you thinking at that point? Like that you want? I was still, still president. I was still thinking I wanted to be president. So the you know the thought process was politics, philosophy, and economics is a very classic degree out of um, essentially Oxford and Cambridge in uh, Britain. And at that time, I was obsessed with Bill Clinton. Like many people who were interested in politics in the '90s, he was intelligent and inspiring and he could, you know, rouse the nation to great things. And I I felt like, oh, wow. And he had studied PPE at Oxford. And I learned that and I saw that it was a course of study at Pomona and it felt like, oh, this is, this is what you do. And up until that point in time, I also believed that the path to politics was through law school. So I should be PPE at Pomona and then I should get into law school. I should go to law school, be a lawyer, and then at some point become representative or senator and then move on to presidency. So that was like the series of steps laid out in my mind up until getting to college. And then what happened to change your path? Because it looks like you almost started to say, I'm going to use the exact opposite side of my brain. I'm yeah. going to go into like pricing strategies and modeling into yeah. investment banking. and Right. You so know. I, I started as a kid like – Eight, nine, ten, playing with computers. My dad brought home uh, IBM Sperry PC. I think I was nine. He brought home a programming book with it, and I started playing with computers and, and programming when I was essentially eight and nine. And then I stopped, but I always liked technology and playing with computers. And I always was really good at math. Um, I was good at school mostly in general, but math sometimes just really came to me and it, it worked. Uh, and so as a result. Like when I was in college and I started to figure out what to do during the summers, I realized I couldn't do internships in law school. I couldn't do like pre-law anything. So I just went to things I was interested in. And a friend of mine had done an internship at Real Networks and got me into Real Networks in 1998. And so I was interested in the internet. I was interested in South Park. I had streamed like the Spirit of Christmas online (laughs) at my college and shown a lot of other people. Kenny? Uh, Yeah, for sure. Um, and I was, I was into, um, MP3s. And so I got this internship at Real Networks and that summer I got to see a whole slew of things that were really exciting to me. So we were building software that allowed people to, you know, kind of like podcasting, 
broadcast their voices all around the world. And Rob Glazer got up at the intern dinner and talked about how he started as Progressive Networks so that people in Bosnia could actually get their voice out and be heard around the world and people could know about the war crimes and the atrocities. And that was that was why I was there, was that this seminal moment of you can collect people's voices and give them more power and the internet is going to do this for everybody and it's it's going to democratize the world because all of us have voices that we should be using and that's what real networks felt like at that point in time and i i met a couple people i was really inspired by who were also interns Mm -hmm. and one of them ended up being my co-founder and cto for um, a number of years at abtenev because we met then and so after that summer I went to do an internship in D.C. at C-SPAN, and that was 1998. So, you know, history rhymes, right? Like 21 years ago, we were in an impeachment inquiry, Mm -hmm. and I was in D.C. during the impeachment inquiry, and I was supposed to be thinking about how do I get into politics, and all I was thinking about was technology and real networks and the Internet and how that's the future. And I also felt very strongly like the more I thought about it, the less I wanted to actually be a lawyer. Mm. Uh, So that fall and winter when I was in D.C., I was actually starting to plot how I could get into technology. And that's how I ended up uh, graduating and going into investment banking was I didn't know how to program. I hadn't taken a lot of courses around that at school, but I I absolutely knew uh, how to be analytical and use math. And I talked my way into an internship at the Quorum Group the next summer after my junior year. Uh, and then I got, talked my way into an investment banking job in San Francisco. And were you covering the tech sector at least? Yeah, it was okay. all, and all investment was just, bank. Alex Brown was all investment bank. I mean, all tech, right? Te- tech and biotech. Like yeah. that Alex Brown was historically very much like leading edge. Mm-hmm. Um, prided themselves on being tech before that it was really well known. And so that was part of the the really the appeal of that practice. I mm-hmm. I talked to Merrill Lynch and J P Morgan and Goldman Sachs and. Um, Morgan Stanley and several others, but Alex Brown was the one that had the legacy that was interesting. They'd taken Starbucks public too. Yeah, so I very just, cool. And so you did all sorts of um, those types of roles, right? Dealing with strategy and pricing and all these things that are um, not back office, but a lot more analytical. The whole time were you thinking kind of, I have this entrepreneurial bug? Yeah. Or were you looking for that lifetime kind of microsoft type of thing? No. I mean, so what the other thing that happened that summer at Real Networks was, uh, so Rob Glazer got up in front of the, the interns and talked for a while and then took questions. And I had a question. And the question was, hey, I love everything you're doing here. I think that this is an amazing company, and I think the future is clearly in front of us. Uh, what do, what are you going to do about MP3s? Because all across my campus, we trade MP3s. We have drives that we've shared with each other, just gigs and gigs of music. Um, but we're not supporting MP3s here. Why not? And Rob goes on a very intelligent um, diatribe about how rights management is important to the industry and DRM and streaming are synonymous. And so you should really be focusing on what they're doing with streaming, not MP3s. And we got in a, like a bit of an argument before he shut me down and I moved on. I love it. Go intern. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we got in this argument. So part of what ended up happening after that summer was I was like, eventually I'm going to go start something. I, I In 98, I basically gave myself a 10-year time horizon. And I was like, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to get all of the knowledge and the skills to go start something. And so that was part of why I also went into finance. I was like, let me learn how the business side of this works mm-hmm. in technology in a fast-paced way. Two years in investment banking is like working five years anywhere Oh, for else. sure. I've had a lot of people on the podcast and friends who are very successful entrepreneurs who started their careers in investment banking. And it also, as you're going to raise and all these other things, you can really um, hold your own. You know what you're looking at. You know how to analyze the numbers. You're not just like, oh, I'm a product person. Yeah. You can, you can, you're really, um, it, it adds a lot to your, um, to your toolkit it does. for sure. It does. And so was your first um, kind of run at being an entrepreneur um, draft MVP? Um, I would say that that's the... That's fantasy sports tools? Yeah. Is that what that was? Yeah. So that was probably my, my second or third. That. My second or third. But okay. what, yeah, draft MVP came across uh, my plate because... A boss of mine, um, a guy I worked for at uh, Yahoo, knew I wanted to eventually start something, had a strong sense in my capabilities, and introduced me to some people he had worked with um, mm. who were working on a fantasy sports application. And it, it was 
it was very much a hobby. We tried to make it a business, but it was more a hobby because nobody was really full time. Mm. And I, what were your other entrepreneurial? Uh, yeah, so you know, I talked about Mike. Mike and I actually started two different companies mm. before Aptenev, where we built some apps, we built some websites, we started to build some technology, but we didn't we didn't really get it shipped and out there and circulated enough. And so along the way, what we were doing was we were hacking on stuff, we were trying to get things put together, um, but we realized and learned a lot of lessons about shipping faster and spending less time planning. Um, and so draft MVP was the first time that something was actually live, and then I took it to a V2 and V3, um, but it was still very much a hobby. Uh, mm. And I love the idea. I still love the idea because yeah. we had this insight that a lot of people didn't have, which was... Uh, as you're going through the process of building a roster, your portfolio changes. And if you just give people analysis around how your portfolio is changing, they'll make better decisions. My son would love this. Like, yeah. he's really into his... Yesterday, he was like, all day long, I have football. I'm like, well, you're not playing football this season. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> football. I'm watching. Because like, he's got to be really? on top of his team, right? You're literally going to sit in front of the TV for like eight hours. <laughs> like, I guess I'm being a good mom. Um, so you started at 10 of 2011. Yep. Sounds like you made your 10-year um, deal. It started probably entrepreneurial endeavors at 2008 at least. I left <laughs> Yahoo in 2008. Good job. Just in time. Mm -hmm. So 2011, you have since raised $17.5 million in About funding. That. Is that right? About that. Yeah. And how is that process been? I mean, how, uh, raising money is never easy and it's always, I think, do you enjoy stressful. it? No, I do not. You don't like it. I do not enjoy raising money. Yeah. I think um, for me, raising money has always felt very much like a, uh, a set of like bad dates. Um, mm. So I didn't really necessarily like dating in San Francisco, for example, and they, they strike me the same way. There's a lot of people looking at the wrong things, like what color your shoes are and if you're wearing like a Gucci belt yeah. versus the things that are inside. And I think a lot of fundraising can end up feeling like they're focusing on all the wrong things as opposed to what's inside. Mm -hmm. um, Who did I've, you ultimately raise money from? So we've we've had the fortune of raising money from a number of um talented investors over the years. So uh, we had Chris DeVore and Founders mm -hmm. Co-op actually led our seed round when we came out of Techstars. Um, and at that time, we got to know Social Leverage, um, which is a firm out of uh, essentially Phoenix in Southern California, Golden Ventures out of Toronto. We actually got to meet the folks from Google Ventures when they were doing seed investing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then over the years, we've raised money from SurveyMonkey, they were a strategic oh. investor in our A round uh, and from Origin Ventures out of Chicago, who uh, has become a great partner of ours. And then um, Greyhawk Capital out of Phoenix, as well as Vulcan here in Seattle. So we have a pretty diverse set of For backers sure. with different backgrounds and interests. And then I think a number of awesome angels in the early days mm -hmm. who have given us a bunch of advice and introductions over the, the mm -hmm. years. So, And what advice would you give entrepreneurs if there's you know, 100 that want to invest and you have to choose. What what qualities would you say entrepreneurs, if it's their first time raising, what should they look for in an investor or board member also? Yeah, so board member and investor are definitely very different things. Um, based on what I've seen and how some of my friends have raised money and been successful and what's gone on, I would say that establishing how you're going to interact with investors is really crucial to who you raise from. So whether you have five people interested or a hundred people interested, if some of it is making sure they know what they're going to get out of you and what you're willing to cooperate with, um, more investors can often become more overhead. But oh, I sure. think that that and changes. And more time investment. It can be. But I think if you set the right expectations for what you're going to do and how you're going to communicate, people will also you know, opt in or opt out. Mm -hmm. depending and on And what about what you, you need from them? So I think that... Um, that's where board member versus investor matters a lot. So a lot of times people talk about investors and the advice and the benefits they offer. And in my experience, it's been sort of random. The mm -hmm. people who we expected to give us help versus the ones who did. Uh, but board members have to be there from a governor's perspective, from a meeting perspective. And so each and every board member, we have five out of ten of, um, each and every board member spends multiple hours every quarter with me, aside from board meetings, you know, some of them spend dozens of hours mm -hmm. with me. Um, and and do, you, we'll, do you feel that you can be vulnerable? I think you have to. Yeah. I think um, it doesn't necessarily happen right away, but if your board is not a uh, board that you can be vulnerable with and talk about your problems as the CEO, you've got the wrong wrong board. Yeah, for sure. And how did you come up with the name, Aptentive? 
What does uh, it mean? It, well, so it means being attentive to the people who use your applications. Ah. Um, so it's very much uh, like logical, literal. <laughs> literal. But the way the company got started was, uh, so Mike, I already mentioned, Andrew, another friend of ours from Pomona College, um, and I built the first version of the software in 30 days. And Andrew lived in San Francisco and flew up and lived with me for about a month. And Mike was here in Seattle. So it was the three of us in Seattle uh, mapped out a 30-day plan to make an MVP that would allow people with an iOS app to embed this framework. And tell tell our listeners what MVP is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Minimum viable minimum product. Minimum viable product. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we did this, this work. Um, and while they were writing the software, I had a bunch of jobs. And those jobs included things like getting a domain name and buying the legal rights. It, but none of that starts until you have a name. Uh, and so my job the first like seven days essentially was to prioritize all the administrivia. And then I very quickly came to the conclusion that we had to have a name. So I gave myself three days and I sat down with a thesaurus, a dictionary and a spreadsheet and listed out 250 names that I then scored and searched for URL availability. And at the end of that, I, the scoring I put in front of Mike and Andrew, and then they voted on which were their favorites, and Aptenov was the one that was You're like the, the dream co-founder. You're so organized, it sounds like, and and also have a strong sense of urgency. Everything you've talked about so far has, like, an end time, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, if I don't have a date for it, I don't get it done. So, yeah, that's smart. Uh, on the flip side, I procrastinate a, lot, procrastinate a ton on things yeah. with no dates. Well, maybe you, you just work well under pressure. I do. I, yeah. I tend to. What exactly does the company do and what's the business model? Yeah, so I've talked about this a l- little bit. You know, like I have this real belief that everybody should have a voice. I think that's part of the reason that I wanted to be president. I felt like I didn't necessarily have the voice that I thought I should when I was eight and brown in a white neighborhood and stuff. Um, so Attentive is about giving all customers voice. And so we work with really large consumer brands, companies like Starbucks and Nordstrom, to help them give their customers a voice, for example, in their mobile applications or on their websites uh, and increasingly in other digital channels. So you're seeing more and more stores have kiosks and screens and you're seeing hotel rooms have screens. There's just all these different uh, places where we as customers are interacting with companies through screens and Aptenov exists to turn that into not just a one-way communication, but a two-way so mm-hmm. that the brand can ask you what's going on for you and how you feel. And it can answer that question increasingly across your journey with them. So it can pinpoint problems faster. So it can make you happier because the reality is if you're a customer of Starbucks and you go into a store seven seven days a week, and they recognize you, and they know what drink to give you. You usually have a great experience, and you have a lot of trust with them when they make mistakes, which mm-hmm. they're going to. Um, and if you put all of those interactions behind a screen, some of that diminishment of trust that happens is really bad for the brand. And Starbucks, like any other brand, can actually increase that opportunity to listen through those screens, but they have to invest in it. And that's what they do by partnering with us. They invest in putting software that will ask you questions at the right time and the right place to make your experience better. Can you give us a real-time example? Mm -hmm. I mean, I use Starbucks daily. I order online and then go pick it up. Um, I use Nordstrom. So I've obviously engaged with Aptentive unknowingly. Tell us how um, Starbucks or Nordstrom, as examples, use yeah. Aptentive. So for, for Nordstrom, when they were uh, starting to deliver on the promise of connecting the mobile app with the in-store experience so that you could go, go into a store and have a dressing room with five things to try on ready for you, which would feel like magic you know, going from like a 10 years stylist, ago, yeah, yeah. Like, like having a personal stylist, basically, is the experience they're trying to deliver on through the app. When they start to do that, they know there's going to be problems along the way. And so they use us after somebody actually in the app orders that experience and then shows up in the store to ask afterwards, how was it? How did it go for you? Mm-hmm. Was it seamless? Were all the items there? Was the person professional? Did they expect you to be there? Was there, well, you know, the so- sorts of questions that they want to understand to say, are we delivering at this experience in these stores so that we can take it to all of our stores? And if mm-hmm. we're not, what are the problems we have to address? 
And if we're not doing it for everybody, which customers do we need to go back and say, hey, we're sorry, we messed Level up. four, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Level four customers and nerds from, I'm kidding, the ones who spend the most. Oh, yeah. No, and so that's part of what our software does really well, too, is that we can take that data and they can say, oh, you know, 100 customers went through this experience. The level four customers, all of them had great experiences. The level one customers did not. And here's mm-hmm. why. Right? So this is, would you say NetNet, it's a customer satisfaction tool? I would say that it's more than that, right? So the way that we think about this is it's not just about customer satisfaction. We live in an experience economy. And what that means is that satisfaction is the lowest minimum bar, right? I think yeah, cat- like, eh, customer fine, satisfaction is like, oh, I'm satisfied. I want people to love yeah. the experiences they have. We use the overused delighted. Yeah. Well, I mean, our, our, our logo, right? This is a podcast, so you can't see me, but I'm wearing our... I or love a ten it. of hoodie. It's it's a heart. Our logo is a heart, it. and it's also an A. So it's kind of. Kind I have of cute. I have heart on everything. Like all of my jewelry is heart. I'm a big heart person. Yeah. I love it. Um, and so, how do you make money? So we partner with these large businesses and charge them based upon the size of their audience, based upon the amount and complexity of their data, but on the analysis that they do. Some of our customers use this just in very simple ways in small apps, and others put us all throughout their. Um, uh, digital processes. So they, they'll put us in a kiosk, they'll put us on their website, they'll put us in their app, uh, and then they'll buy uh, extraordinarily detailed reports on a quarterly basis that tell them, hey, in this DMA or in this uh, zip code, you're having satisfaction challenges on this set of problems, or your loyalty rewards members are actually increasing in, in their happiness in a pretty dramatic fashion as a result of this release. And so we can really help them pinpoint what's going on and get better. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that relationship might be really like hundreds of thousands of dollars, or it might start out in tens of thousands of dollars, but mm-hmm. that's how we make I'm money. I'm sure it's probably hard for you to be in any sort of store now without thinking all the time of what you could be doing yeah. to improve that experience. I'm sort of a retail geek. No, I, 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 like I, to go I was to raised in the industry and we used to do um, secret shopping for our company. No way. And so, yeah, I can't go into any store without having an eye for that. 100%. So do you have a favorite? A favorite store? Yeah. I like people who move really fast. And it's really difficult to find salespeople who can keep up with my level of decision making. Oh, interesting. How quickly I make decisions. Okay. So, you know, that that thinking of like keep them in the dressing room and units per transaction and bringing them things. Like yeah. a really good salesperson would, I'd be going into try on jeans and a smart person would bring in a great pair of boots, a belt, some accessories, a shirt, and then just keep running. Yeah. You know, to start to. Does anybody do that fast enough for you? Um, I mean, I work with people sometimes, and I shop at my girlfriend's store. It's like more of a boutique, yep. and they just know me at this point. Yeah. Um, and I've started to shop a little bit off um, Instagram. I think about this always through the lens of, like, imagine the spectrum of needs for all the customers. Our our ambition as a company is to be able to meet all of those needs mm-hmm. as these as all of these experiences get little digital touch points. Where are we going to go? Where do we have to go in the future? Which means we have to think about voice. We have to think about like image and facial recognition. We have to think about all of that in the mm-hmm. future. So. Well, I mean, if we're going to talk Nordstrom in particular, I can tell you that their point of sale um, experience is flawed. Yep. For example, I bought these shirts for my husband. And I couldn't remember his neck size. So I was like, can you guys just look it up? I've bought like eight of the same shirt. Is it a 17 or 17 and a half? I don't even know. And I wanted to get it right. And so they were like, well, which month did you buy it? I'm like, and that's every single time you shop at Nordstrom, you have to know what month and what exactly you bought. And I'm like, you should just be able to look me up and just type in the designer and everything I've ever bought from that designer should just come up. Right. And that's such an obvious problem that they should be solving for, right? Yes. That history of things you've purchased. Yeah. Anyway, we could talk about retail. We could go oh, for, for cocktail. Sure. I talk about retail forever. Um, I know you've been really intentional. How many people do you have now? 60. 60. Yeah. That's like legit. Do you know everybody's name still? Yes, for sure. That's important. <laughs> I think so too. But there's a certain tipping point where it's like, uh-oh, are we still that like family that we intended on being? And when you really knew everybody and knew kind of birthdays and, oh, I just moved and this one got a dog. And I love yeah. that feeling. I'm like, my company's about 17 people, but my um, tipping point where I feel like, uh-oh, is probably maybe 40. Yeah. Um, how have you been intentional about creating your culture and what do you do to review it, reinforce it? Yeah. Um, well, we we had a set of values that the four of us who were co-founders in the first year 
um, set up. So in year three, we really sat down and set up, here are the values, and we rolled them out and we talked about them and we used them in reviews and it was it was a part of the conversation. And then a couple years ago, um, we realized that the values had gotten stale and that people were struggling. As we were 25 at that point uh, in time, going to 30, it wasn't scaling as well because really what the values came down to is like the four co-founders, what they feel these things mean is basically like there's a there's a pretty good set of interconnections, intersections, and that scales uh, up until 15 to 20. But then beyond that, it was not prescriptive enough. It was too generic. And so we went through a process of asking the people who were on the team what values just in general, not the ones that we had, they felt most aligned with out of a list of 35 and which five they didn't feel most aligned with. And we took that and that gave us direction of who we really were. So we took the viewpoint of our company is about feedback. It's about giving people a voice. Let's give everybody a voice. What's this mean? What does it say about us, about who we are? And then where do we want to be? So we decided to start saying, well, here are four that are existent Mm -hmm. that we believe are really strong. And then there are three that are emergent that we want to be, that we want to push ourselves. Do you know the three are off the top? I hate it when people ask me mine because I start to freeze even though I I created them. Yeah. yeah. So one is about taking action. uh, The other is about celebrating change. And the third is about owning your results. All three of those in some way had more that we need to be aspirational around about mm. putting into the company because we we had gotten slower about taking action. We were not making decisions as quickly. That was part of the problem. And I think, you know, at the size that you're at and the size we were at that point in time, it's it started to become like, oh, we should ask Roby's opinion or we should ask Mike's opinion. And you know, mm-hmm. we, were, we, were doing, we were doing ourselves a disservice because we needed everybody to be able to say, I'm going to make this choice. Mm-hmm. And know that they're choice. not going to fail or That's that right. they could recover quickly. So. Um, and so you said four co-founders. I know it was you and Mike. Yeah. And then um, were there other two that you were just like, hey, we got to round this out skill so, set wise or title wise? Or why did you need two more co-founders? Well, part, part of it was... Um, as I mentioned, that Andrew also went to school with us at Pomona. So Andrew and Mike were the same year, class of 02. I was class of 2000. Um, and when Mike and I had started working on ideas before this, you know, we hadn't really gotten over the hump and gotten anything released. And when we started talking about this idea, we realized that we needed to build for iOS um, in order to release something. And so at a certain point in time, the conversation about who needed to help us out circled back to Andrew because Andrew and I had taken a long road trip when I moved to Seattle from San Francisco up here. Andrew drove with me. And that's where the like the germ of the idea for Abtenev actually came up was I was driving up to Seattle in a uh, U-Haul with him and he had left Apple about the same, same time I left Yahoo. And then that whole road trip, I was just asking him about what he was doing. And he was building apps. He was selling apps in the App Store. And he was making four to $500 a day. So it's December of 2008. He's doing really well. App Store is six months old. I'm doing the math. I'm like, ah, oh, that's, that's not too bad. That's really <laughs> healthy, right? It's a very good business. And so I, I was just peppering him with questions. And that was the germ of the idea. So when it came time for us a couple of years later, Mike and I had still been playing around with this idea and toying with it and saying, well, we need somebody to help us on iOS. It was clear Andrew was the person we we should ask. And I did. I, I was in San Francisco. We had coffee. I asked him, you know, don't you think that idea we talked about years ago is even more important now? And he said, yes. And I said, shouldn't we go build it? I think Mike and I are ready, but we need your help. And he said, let's do it. And so he said, like, looking at the calendar, a couple of months from now, it's wide open. I'll just come up and stay with you. And so that was... That was how Andrew got involved. And then after we'd built the MVP, we started telling people. Mm. Uh, and one of the people we told was another friend of ours, an, an ex-roommate of, of Andrew's. His name is Sky. Uh, he'd become a friend of mine. And unbeknownst to me, Sky was leading up Android development for an SDK at an advertising company in San Francisco. With an SDK. So software development kit, which is fundamentally what we produced, like our first unit of developer value was a software development kit somebody could put into their uh, iOS app and collect feedback. So when we started talking about this, Sky heard about it. Maybe the idea was two months old, like the MVP had been built. And he said, do you need help on Android? And we said, yes, absolutely. Um, And that's how the team came to be. It was the minimum requirement. And do you have all four of you still intact now? So all four of us are still involved, but Mm -hmm. day to day, I'm the only one who's involved. Who's running, who's still doing it. 
That's great. And so everybody else is kind of more in an advisory or mm-hmm. kind of go-to That's correct. capacity. Great. And so you must have a lot of weight on your shoulders. How do you uh, relax and unwind? Uh, running. I like to run. That's been something I've been doing for, shoot, almost 14 years now uh, that I picked up when I was in San Francisco. So that's big stress reliever. I've got a couple of running friends and partners that I try to go running with. Mm-hmm. Uh, reading. Reading's always been something I talked about it when I was a kid that Are I you go reading to. like business books or just books for pleasure? I find that I have to do both. I have mm-hmm. to do fiction and nonfiction. And if I'm only reading? doing nonfiction, it's it's uh it's slow going. Uh, yeah. But what, I, what are you reading right now? So I just finished Fall, which is the the latest book out of um, Neil Stevenson. Um and it, uh, it's uh sort of like a continuation of a series. Um and then uh, I'm I'm currently reading a book on uh, essentially net promoter score called the Ultimate Question 2.0, which is the industry we work in. Yeah, and they use NPS a lot. Yeah, it's so funny that you say that. I almost like ten minutes ago when we were talking about it, said, "Should I be focused on my net promoter score?" Yeah, we have a um, the question we ask a lot of customers. Like, would you is refer? Called, do you love? Do we actually love? do you love this app or experience? And we've asked that of like eight hundred million people around the world. Literally eight hundred mm-hmm. million. Yeah. And how many say love? Uh, I think the global data is sixty-seven percent. And what's your goal? Uh, we don't have a, a goal because we do this. If um, you think about it, we do this on behalf of all these customers yeah. of ours. Yeah. Right. So our goal for them is to help them just understand. What's but if changing. you're are you if you're coming to them, you're not consulting them. Also, or are you just saying, hey, here's the scoop. Do with we, it. What we you give want. them so based upon your industry, for example, you might have a different benchmark. So what we help them understand is how they rack. Uh, like how they stack up against or rank against people who they consider competition in the category Um, and then just in general companies that are similar sizes. Mm -hmm. But for example, financial services, getting people to love you is, um, (laughs) it's an interesting um, balance because most people will say that they don't love their financial services institutions, but the financial services institutions that they rely upon for like... um, their mortgage, for example, has a much higher weight. So retail mm, banks will get course. a lot more love than like very transactional banks. Like mm. stock brokerages and things like that are oftentimes viewed more transactionally and have less Probably depends on the day too, it how, how the market's doing. Yeah. Right? And that's, I mean, that's one of the things we think about a lot because, you know, a lot of people ask these questions once a year and think that they've checked the box and done a good job. And our, our viewpoint is if your customer deals with you every month, you should ask them how they're doing every month. A hundred percent. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that that's changed. I think that the whole mentality around it, just like employee, um, understanding your employees has changed. People used to measure that once a year. Now it's like, hey, you need to know more frequently how they're doing. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that totally makes sense. I know that you say that you do a lot of reading. You do a little bit of podcasting. (laughs) um, And you yourself do some speaking. Yeah. Is there anything lately that's been like really um, inspiring to you or anything that's... um, I guess, caused you to rethink the way that you're doing things in life? Hmm. That's a great question. I don't know that anything recently has made me rethink um, the way I'm doing things in life. I would say I find myself more and more interested in exploring mediums and channels that don't feel comfortable to me as a way to try and keep my mind flexible and open. So Mm -hmm. what I mean by that is like, I think, so I'm 42, right? So at 42, there are certain media channels that just don't show up in my stream very commonly because in my circle of friends, people use Facebook and they text message each other. And some of them use WhatsApp, especially if they're international. And a lot of them use Instagram. Some use Twitter. Um, but nobody really uses TikTok. I only know a few people who use TikTok. Or Snapchat. Or Snapchat, yeah. And so I try to actually open those things up from time to time just to see what's going on. And I will find random people on TikTok doing an amazing job with some music I've seen before, heard before, but never seen performed in a certain way in like 30-second snippets, which is, I think, not life-changing, but it's a reminder of how broad culture is and how easy it is for us to like dismiss things because I'll say TikTok to a bunch of friends and 80% of them like oh yeah you and the teenagers and they just sort of dismiss or, it. or my nine-year-old who's like loves TikTok <laughs> yeah we actually did a TikTok together last night it's oh that's so awesome funny. yeah that's great um do you have any um rituals or ways that you try to set yourself up for a good day mm, that's a good question 
Um, Thanks. I'm two for two. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I think starting the day is a really meaningful time. And so for me, when I've had my best starts to the day, I can say that I've done one of three things, maybe even all three. So uh, I've started off not looking at a screen. So I, I don't, my wife and I do not allow our phones in the bedroom. Like it's a deterrent to sleep and we think it's distracting and it's a very easy way to wake up. And, you know, so we don't do that. So I won't wake up and just look at my phone. But I sometimes will wake up and I'll take my book that I'm working on. And before I look at email, before I do anything that's going to take me down the course of like, oh, I've got to do X, Y, and Z, I just intentionally sit down and read for a half hour. That's that's great. That's awesome. Before coffee? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. For sure. Um, maybe it's at the same time, but like to me, coffee is a ritual, not a thing that wakes me up. Um, the second thing that would be part of that great morning is uh, going for a run. Maybe it's 20 minutes, maybe it's an hour, but going for a run and getting that done. Uh, and then the third is actually like sit and stretch. And if I do all three of those things in a morning, like that's a great morning. And what time are we talking? <sighs> you know, waking up somewhere between six and seven. Mm -hmm. um, but there are days where I'm really good about putting myself to sleep the night before early, which means like by 10, 30 or 11. Mm -hmm. And then I'm probably starting at 5 or 5.30. Yeah. And so you don't require a lot of sleep, it sounds like. Not a ton. I'm trying to be better about that. Yeah. I I'm... think the more that my team has grown, the more I've realized that the emotional um, work that I do is really intense and it means I need more recovery time. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And are, are there any habits that you're trying to... Well, beyond the three things, but um, that you're trying to break or create? I am trying to get myself regularly to bed more early, just yeah. before Do you watch midnight. TV? I do. Yeah, that's my problem, is that I like, I mean, yeah. I, I binge shows. Yep. Okay, I've got a lot, two more questions. Um, if you had a crystal ball and you could learn something about the world, I know that you're a very globally minded and intentional thinker. Um, what would you want to know about the world, and what would you want to know about your life? Ooh. So these are, like, things that are not obvious to me I would want, like, an answer to. Yeah, if you could just look into a crystal ball and be like, what will this be in, you know, 40 years? Yeah, well, I I think that, um, unfortunately right now, I am I'm concerned with sort of the state of democracy. I yeah. am concerned with the way in which... Um, we have uh, here in this country allowed you know, a bunch of people, I think, to take um, take power and close down voice and close down choice. And so looking forward, I, I hope that we solve this and I hope we figure out the way around it. I think, you know, the first action is for everybody to vote and use their voice because I think I think most most of us want the right things for the world and do not. I uh, think that our uh, misfortunes are the cause of other people coming here for opportunity. Um, so I would look forward towards that. What would I like to see for myself? Um... I know it's a tough question. I don't think I could answer it for myself. Yeah, I think that um, I'm pretty excited about the the journey that I'm on with you know the company and with the people who matter to me. And I would like to see how my legacy right? I do think about long-term impact on people and I think that uh, I'm fortunate to be in a place where I could help uh, customer relationships get better and I can help companies get better at dealing with customers and I would like mm -hmm. to see if we play this out and actually have a global impact yeah that'd be amazing well that leads perfectly to my last question which is you talked about legacy but like what ultimately fuels you I really do think that giving people a voice is a, it's a calling. It's something that I've felt a long, long time in my life and in the last decade have, have felt a way to actually take action. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I think to me being able to, to use your voice, to speak out and make change, to share information, to increase the lines of communication is something that's important and it's driven me and it feels right and it feels just and it feels like a meaningful value. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. Well, I'm looking forward to continuing uh, to watch you grow and succeed. And I'm really grateful that you took the time to be on the podcast. Thank you so much for yeah, this. Yeah, thank this you. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. And follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com. To provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. 
We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You. Thank you.